and welcome back to the Back to Space News Flash, where we're talking about things that are currently happening, things that are going to happen, and things that have happened in space. So this past Friday was the storm on Area 51, the day I personally have been waiting for. What started out as a joke on Facebook was shut down after two million people said that they were going to attend. And also a website was made in which you can buy t-shirts with an alien running captioned, I'm going. But when push came to shove, only 3,000 or so people showed up. 3,000 or so, it's a town of 54 people. And they threatened they were gonna storm in and see what they're holding in Area 51. Where are the aliens? Tell me. But then the local officers warned them about the consequences, AKA death by machine gun. And they had some second thoughts. Common sense, guys. The Air Force literally thought this was 0% funny and they promised to stand ready to protect America and its assets, end quote. So Roberts, the guy that actually created the Facebook post, switched tactics. He started to promote a music festival titled Alien Stock. What else would they name it? But then he pulled out of the festival because he feared it would run into humanitarian disasters. Guys. Do you remember Fire Festival? This would have been better than that. But unfortunately, or fortunately, the alien guy was like, you know what? I'm smarter than Billy. <laughs> Onwards, the biggest volcano in the Jupiter moon low is about to erupt any day now. Okay, Loki Patera, a 125 mile wide also known as 200 kilometers, if we're being specific. Lava Lake on the most volcanically, volcanically active body in the solar system had fairly regular activity over the past few decades. And it's due for an outburst very soon. I'm due for an outburst very soon too. If this behavior remains the same, Loki should erupt in September of 2019. Julie Rathburn, a senior scientist at the Planetarium Science Institute in Tucson, Arizona. Oh, hey girl, I'm from there too. She said, we correctly predicted that the last eruption would occur in May of 2018. Snaps, we're never questioning you again. She says, because of its size, basic physics are likely to dominate when it erupts. However, you gotta be careful because Loki is named after a trickster god. <laughs> and the volcano has not been known to behave itself. Guys, remember literally last week, I started making a joke about Loki, I had that whole section. I'm beginning to think there's a trend here. I'm Loki a genius. <laughs> I reused that joke. Am I fired? No? Okay. There have been reports that the Russians will keep the cause of an air leak on the International Space Station in 2018 a secret. Jim Bridenstine has promised to speak personally with the head of the Russian Space Agency. Quote, they have not told me anything, end quote. Here's the problem. He does want to keep a good relationship with the Russians as they are chief partners on the orbiting complex. This is why you never move in until you're sure. It's questions like who moves out first? Who stays on the lease? How does this work in space? I want answers too, Jim. Bridenstine's comments came in the wake of a report by the Russian's state-run international news agency. Quote, what happened is clear to us, but we won't tell you anything, end quote. Wow, shots fired. Secret secrets are no fun unless I am a part of one. <laughs> Tell us your secrets, Russia. Okay, following up on the Indian moon lander. So just to break it down, there are three parts to this. The Chandrayaan-2 is an orbiter carrying the lander named Vikram and the rover Pragyan. Hopes to retrieve the Vikram lander with the rover Pragyan housed inside it are fading as the 14-day window for the ISRO, Indian Space Research Organization, to restore its link with the lander ended on September 21st, Saturday. The IRSRO said the Chandrayaan-2 took photos on September 10th of the lander lying flat or tilted on its side, but they're not gonna release those images. The solar power lander's electronics is not expected to survive the frigid night. Have you seen Wally? -E? This is so depressing. I can only imagine how sad it feels. It's all alone and he can't talk to anybody. And this is just like really sad. You do not know if it has feelings or not. Wally. <laughs> all right, guys, on to the next. This is some hard science, so strap in. 
Before I break this down, let me go ahead and read you the headline. We're all used to thinking of planets orbiting stars, but maybe they exist around supermassive black holes too. I have called my dad multiple times to have him explain this to me. Dad? Help! Okay, planet formation is usually thought to begin with a disk of dust and gas around a star. Gradually, this material clumps together and its gravity then draws in more material. This builds a planet. So there is a new study out there performed by Kichi Wada at the Kagoshima University in Japan. He performed the first study that claims the possibility of direct formations of planets like objects which are not associated with stars, but supermassive black holes. What does that mean? I still don't get it. Okay, so this is substituting a black hole instead of a star as the source of the gravitational attraction to cause the objects to orbit. Wow, did we get through that? Okay, great. Why do I feel like I'm gonna be annihilated in the comment section here? Also, Annihilation was a great movie. Okay, now we're on to our fun section about something semi-related to space, but not totally about space because it's about UFOs. <laughs> Let's chat about the history of Area 51 in the wake of the storm, or lack thereof. In the early 1950s, U.S. planes were conducting a low-flying recon missions over the USSR. But, rightfully so, we were worried that they would see us and shoot us down. Pew, pew, pew! Not a good luck. So, in 1954, President Eisenhower authorized the development of a top-secret, high-altitude recon aircraft dubbed Project Aquatone. It needed to be in a remote location that was not accessible to civilians or spies. Alas, Area 51 was born! <laughs> Aww. And no one knows why it's called Area 51. I have scoured the internet. Just accept it, that's the name. In September of 1955, the first sighting of the unidentifying flying objects, also known as UFOs, were reported around Area 55. <laughs> In reality, this was the Air Force beginning its test on the U-2 aircraft, which is what led to the increase of UFO sightings in the area. While the Air Force officials knew the UFO sightings were actually U-2 tests, that's a good band, by the way, they couldn't really tell the public. So they explained the aircraft sightings by saying they were a natural phenomenon. The testing of the U-2 ended in the late 1950s, but Area 51 has continued to serve as the testing ground for many aircrafts, including the F-117A, the A-12, and Tactic Blue. The public found out that Area 51 officially existed in August 2013, after Dr. Jeffrey T. Richelson, a senior fellow at George Washington University National Security Archive submitted a Freedom of Information Act request in 2005 for information on the CIA's Lockheed U-2 plane reconnaissance program. The request forced the CIA to declassify documents on the history of the U-2 and the A-12 ox cart program and the military base where the planes were constructed and tested. Area 51. Now, today, people apparently try to, you know, storm the beaches of uh, Area 51, and I just have so many questions. Dad, are aliens real? Have you been to Area 51? Do you know the secrets? Tell me! This week in space history, NASA intentionally crashed Galileo into Jupiter on September 21st, 2003. Not that Galileo, this Galileo. Galileo is significant because it was humanity's first spacecraft to orbit Jupiter, and it discovered evidence of salt water below the surface of three of Jupiter's moons, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. Now, many scientists believe life may live in those waters, which is why NASA decided to intentionally crash into Jupiter rather than accidentally crashing into one of those moons. Great, so let's move on to things that are going to happen. This is my favorite part. I like to predict the future. You will subscribe to this channel. Putting astronauts on the moon in 2024 is a tall order, NASA has said. If you're skeptical that NASA cannot actually pull this off, you're not alone. During a hearing of the Space Subcommittee of the U.S. House of Representatives, multiple representatives voiced concerns about the agency's progress towards the ambitious 2024 lunar landing goal. And one of the key witnesses, Ken Bowersox, NASA's Acting Associate Administrator for Human Exploration and Operations, didn't exactly put their deadline doubts to rest. 
when Representative Bill Posey asked how confident he was that NASA would meet the proposed target of 2024, Bauer Sox responded, and I quote, I would not bet my oldest child's upcoming birthday present or anything like that. Would you bet your youngest child's upcoming birthday present on that? What does that mean? In other news, a pair of young scientists from Columbia University have a distinctly sci-fi-ish idea that may actually work and cost far less than a rocket spaceship system. Students Zephyr Penori and Emily Sanford proposed an idea of a lunar space elevator, which is exactly what it sounds like. A very, very long elevator connecting the moon to our planet. You know those awkward elevator conversations? Imagine that, times a million. The concept of a moon elevator isn't exactly new. In the 1970s, similar ideas were floated around in science fiction, but the Columbia study differs from previous proposals in important ways. So instead of building the elevator from the Earth's surface, which is impossible with today's technology, it would be anchored on the moon and stretch some 200,000 miles down toward Earth until hitting the geostationary orbit height, about 22,236 miles above sea level, at which objects move around Earth in lockstep with its planet's own rotation. That's cool. And finally, before we go, Back to Space has decided in each one of these weekly news flashes, we are gonna be featuring one of our amazing 25 student ambassadors. So today we have Trace. Like all Group 1 student ambassadors, he is incredibly intelligent. I am telling you that these kids are, they make me feel like I shouldn't call my father and ask for help. Am I smart? Not only is he incredibly intelligent, like all the Group 1 student ambassadors, but he also runs cross country and plays basketball. He's the treasurer for the student government. He is a member of the Math Honor Society. He has participated in theater competitions from sixth grade until now. And you can go ahead and check him out as well as all the student ambassadors. They are putting together some amazing videos on the Back to Space student ambassador page. Thanks so much for watching, guys. Again, I'm Daniel Dallas Rusa, and I am so excited to every Monday morning give you the Back to Space News Flash. So make sure you subscribe so you're not missing out. Also, if you want to check out last week, click here. And why don't you go ahead and comment about your favorite theory of Area 51? What's going on? Also, be sure to check out the Back to Space student ambassadors here. And please subscribe so I can see you next Monday morning. <laughs>